everyone to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, that was Stephen Warner on the Barton organ uh, with uh, quite a uh, medley of Broadway tunes. Uh, the last tune from La Cage aux Faux. I don't know if anybody recognized it, but Jerry Herman, the great Jerry Herman just passed away recently, so cheers to you, Jerry. Uh, Today, uh, I want to wish everybody best wishes for the new year. This is our first time coming back, and we are off and running into 2020, a new decade at the top of the winter season, and our new calendar is available in the lobby, so you should pick one up on your way out and not miss a thing. We have a great season of events for you. Uh, as we have recommencing, this is part two of our season theme, Gather. Uh, I cannot imagine a better speaker to lead off with uh, this season uh, as we present a real proponent of democracy, a mover and a shaker, a man of many hats, one of which is the artistic director of the public theater in New York City, Oscar Eustace. Uh, and today's event is co-presented with the University Musical Society. Uh, so a big thank you to UMS. UMS has been and continues to be an extraordinary partner to the series here with many gifts that they bestow on our whole you know, greater southeastern Michigan community. Uh, and this event today here, we are kicking off the UMS No Safety Net Festival. This is this festival, UMS is bringing us three weeks of provocative theater works that are centered around social and political issues of our time that need us to think about them, need us to talk about them, need us to digest them as a community and as a society. The stage production portion of this festival opens next week on Wednesday day with The Believers Are But Brothers. This is on masculinity and internet radicalization, followed by New York Times critics pick and top 10 list. Is this a room reality winner verbatim transcription? This is on patriotism, interrogation, and whistleblowing. Rounding out by the show White Feminist. This is on race, feminism, and privilege. All of these stage performances are taking place on North Campus at the Arthur Miller Theater and in the Duderstadt Center. The festival also includes an unforgettable one-on-one -on -one gallery experience of a refugee's haunting journey called As Far As My Fingertips Take Me. Uh, this is a, an installation happening in two locations. The performances will take place throughout the festival in both Ann Arbor here at the Institute for Humanities uh, and in Dearborn at the Arab American National Museum. Now, in addition to all these fabulous titles being presented, No Safety Net, like today, is offering a full suite of related activities, including an internet troll workshop, a creator podcast series, community activist dialogues, and thematic discussions, which include the likes of former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid, retired FBI agent Gregory Stetchall, and Billy Winner Davis, who is the mother of the incarcerated whistleblower Reality Winner, among others. So, lots to check out. This is going on for the next three weeks, so you've got a, a lot of rich activity to do in this terrible weather. Come inside, be with other people. For more info and to snag your tickets, go to ums.org. Super simple. And students, remember, you get the incredible deal of a student price ticket for only 12 bucks a pop, so don't miss it. This is a real feat and a real treat to have this here in Ann Arbor in the middle of the country. I would say our next three weeks of theater here is as good or better than what's going on in the London theater season right now. So, don't miss it. Uh, for all of our regular series patrons that are with us today, I want to just start the year by closing out and following up on the gratitude campaign that we embarked on last fall in the wake of losing our patroness, Penny Stamps. Uh, we spent the fall season uh, gathering your thoughts around the series and the impact of Penny's vision, which is still bringing us together. And all of the letters that you so graciously wrote and your ideas that you offered, we bound them into a book and we presented it to her family. Actually, uh, Frank, if you could give me, we made Barbara Brown, who many of you know, an artist in our community, made this beautiful box, and next slide, 
with all of the letters inside and it was presented to the family and they thank you so much because this really meant the world to them. So to everyone who wrote a letter, to all the students who helped gather notes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Frank, back to the show today. Uh, so, we will have a Q&A if you have questions for Mr. Eustace at the end. We will not have our regular jaunt around the corner to the screening room. We're actually holding the Q&A in here today. You will notice there are microphones on stands at the ends of these two aisles. So when he invites you to ask questions, folks can line up at these two microphones and uh, we'll have some time for that. Now, for a proper introduction of our guest, we have an author and an esteemed social historian whose career trajectory has taken him on a journey where he started here at U of M and went away and has now come back to us. Uh, many moons ago, he served here at U of M as the Dean of Rackham, some of you may remember, then left to become provost at Emory University, most recently for many years was the president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, which is where he and Oscar Eustace became friends. Uh, he's now returned to us, he's back at U of M. He is the founding director of the U of M Center for Social Solutions, which fosters collaborations and academic research that diagnose and solve critical social problems that impede the fulfillment of a prosperous democratic society. So very fitting for today's event. Uh, and we have to thank him because he really helped us in getting Oscar here. So please welcome Earl Lewis. Thank you, Christina. Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure and considerable honor to introduce my dear friend and one of America's greatest artistic leaders, Oscar Eustace, the artistic director of the Public Theater in New York City. While he calls Brooklyn home and New York City his place of work, Oscar is a son of the Midwest, having been born and raised in the Twin Cities. He is a son of academics, both sets. Perhaps that is why he took a more circuitous route to the academy himself. He graduated high school at 15 with his world inflected by the left-leaning politics of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota and the CP. He tried school for a while, started his own theater company, finished school, and moved from Switzerland to San Francisco and then to New York with stints as a professor of theater, speech, and drama at Brown and other faculty appointments at Middlebury and NYU to round out his academic life. Foremost, however, Oscar is an intellectual worker and a theater guy. He and his wife Lori and their daughter Kyle can be found at the public or in some other theater venue in the city five, six nights of the week on average. While my wife Susan Whitlock and I lived in New York, I recall Oscar saying to us a year before the premiere, there's this play you want to see. It is written by this guy, Lynn manuel Miranda. You may know him for his work on In the Heights. His new play is about Alexander Hamilton. Susan, of course, has seen the earlier play. I played catch up. But we listened to the advice and we're there for the opening night at the public. Thanks for the tip, Oscar. <laughs> Oscar knows that art has the ability to transform as it transfixes. If done well, it challenges conventions, raises questions, makes one uneasy, resets expectations, and endures, settling in between the synapses refusing to surrender a hold on the imagination. Theater is the place the Obamas and the Cheneys saw the same production, albeit at different times, and, and could agree on what they saw. Through art, as Oscar has observed, boundaries are crossed. In a profile in the New York Times a couple of years after the death of his son Jack, he noted, what I see over and over is narratives that are absolutely lying to the audience about how life works out, and they are lying to the audience for the sole purpose of making the audience feel good. That's not what art is for. The mission that I feel like I have is to figure out how you can tell the truth about how tragic and unfair life actually is 
without destroying hope. The roster of plays that have benefited from his careful eye and expert direction reads like a who's who's list. There is the mega hit Hamilton, of course, or the highly successful Fun Home, or the Pill Surprise winning Sweat. But to review the list of plays is to detect something more. Oscar has made sure the public amplifies what he knows intrinsically. Stories of the human condition and human experience are owned by no group, race, religion, gender, sexual community, age, language, or national population. Be it at the Delacorte in Central Park or in one of the Astor Place theaters, artists and theater matter. This afternoon, it is my pleasure to present this year's Penny Stamp Speaker, co-sponsored with UMS, the award-winning artistic director, dramaturg, and director, and my friend and brother, Oscar Eustace, who is speaking on theater and democracy. Oscar. That was so undeserved. Uh, yeah. So it's now clear to all of you that I should have been introducing Earl, um, who's considerably better speaker and more distinguished career than mine. But here I am, I'm what you've got. I haven't been in Ann Arbor for 45 years. 45 years ago in 1975, I was here as a 16 year old. I had graduated high school and I had kind of run away from home. And, hitchhiked my way here because there was an experimental theater festival in Ann Arbor and I was enamored of the experimental world. This was in the mid 70s, so th th there was a counterculture. I was sort of part of it. And because it was the mid 70s, all very confusing. And sort of, you know, what you did with your sexual life and what your politics were and experimental art and gurus were all sort of mixed together and without any clear distinguishing feet. Between. But I knew I was part of a counterculture. And here in Ann Arbor, I met the living theater for the first time, one of the great theaters in American history, absolute radicals. And they did a piece called Legacy of Cain, in which it was actually a traveling promenade piece. We went around to different places in Ann Arbor protesting everything we could think of to protest. And the living theater is fantastic. And there was a bank, and I don't remember which bank it was, in which the, the living took the whole crowd of us there. And then they burned Monopoly money signifying that they were not going to be ruled by the dollar. And at 16 year old, I, I had tears streaming down my face and I took out every real dollar in my wallet and I burned it. <laughs> and um, the next day I called home for bus fare to get back home to Minneapolis. Um, so, you know, so from the beginning for me, there's been a tension between the desire for art, if you will, the desire for experiment, the desire to bust boundaries, and the belief that it has to mean something to society. And at that time, crudely, it sort of separated into experimental theater and social justice work. And right there at 16, burning those dollars, I was starting to try to figure out how to put these things together. But why the theater? Um, and, and really what I'm gonna try to do to you today is, and for some of you it's not necessary, but is to make a case for why the theater has something to offer us that we need to cherish. Aristotle said that imitation is the earliest and most pleasurable form of learning. And think about that, the, the desire to role play, the desire to be somebody else, it's in our kids. It's in us when we're tiny. And why is that? Because somehow we understand that by stepping out of our shoes into somebody else's shoes, we're expanding the possibilities of who we can be. We're imagining what the world looks like. And we know this, and we can go back before Aristotle to the birth of the Greek theater. And we know some things about the origins of Western theater. We know that it sprang from the festival of Dionysius. We know that all of Athens sat for three days on the side of the Acropolis and listened to music and heard poetry read and rituals enacted and dance and storytelling. And sometime around the turn of the sixth century, somebody got the idea that instead of just telling a story, 
So let's look at me right now. I'm talking to you. And what does that say about our status relationship? I'm the privileged one. I'm the one who has the information. I have the answers. And if you have any disagreements with me, you're expected to sit back and keep quiet about them until the Q&A period when, when I will welcome. In other words, you're receiving wisdom from me. But somebody, legend has it, the name was Thespis, said, what happens instead if I just turn and I don't talk to you anymore, but I talk to somebody else on stage? And that little turn changes everything. Suddenly, I'm not the guy with the answers. I'm a guy with an opinion. And because I'm talking to somebody else, that person has an opinion that's different than mine, right? Conflict. So immediately you're saying that the nature of truth is different. That truth is not the possession of a person, but truth is to be found in the conflict of different points of view, which was the essence of theater when Thespers first invented dialogue, and it remains so today. Now, I, you know, I have been saying for years, and I think I'm right, that it's not a coincidence that in that same decade when Thespis invented dialogue, Athens invented democracy, invented the idea that power should flow from below to above, that ruling could only happen by the consent of the governed. And Athens was by no means a democracy that we should emulate. It was a slave society. You needed property to vote. And I'm going to say this very loudly because Hannah Gatsby called me out for it and it was one of the great humiliations of my life. Women were not enfranchised. That's a horrible thing. However, that idea, that viral idea that power should flow from below to above started in Athens at the turn of the 6th century. Theater started at the same time. Why? Because democracy created theater, because theater created bureaucracy, or in reality, we know it's always more complicated than that. Theater was the appropriate art form for a democracy. Because what theater demanded is what we demand from democratic citizens. We demand that we believe that nobody has sole possession of the truth. If you actually believe that you are right, and everybody on the other side is wrong, you actually don't believe in democracy. You can say you believe in democracy, but actually for you, it's just a tactic to get your way. If you really believe in democracy, you have to believe that truth is found in the interpenetration of different points of view, in conflict, in dialogue, in the theater. You also, as democratic citizens, have to exercise an art that we are growing weaker at by the year these days, which is the art of empathy, the art of imagining somebody else's point of view. Because that's what I'm trying to do when I'm not lecturing at you, when I'm on stage talking. What's happening at that point, I, I'm not asking you to lean back and listen to what I'm saying. I'm asking you to lean forward and imagine what my point of view is, why I'm feeling the way it is. And if the play is good, then there's somebody else who I'm asking you to imagine with them a second later and empathize with them. It is an exercise in putting yourself in other people's shoes, which is what democracy needs in order to survive. It's the virtues of democratic citizenship. And what it also does is something that we're doing here tonight, but that you know we do eight times a week in six different theaters of the public theater, which is bringing together a community of people to feel to think, to share, to have different points of view about ideas and feelings and characters that are presented to them. The best theater, you may walk in as an individual consumer, but you walk out as a member of a community, a member of an audience. And you know, we, we can actually prove this too. This is an example I'm stealing from Bob Brustein, but it's so good. When you go to the movies, you want the theater to be empty. You're hoping that you can put your coat down and put your coat on the other one. And if it's the stadium seating, I get to put my feet over the seat in front of me. And then there's just nothing in between me and the movie. And when I walk into a movie theater and it's 90% full, my heart sinks. Exactly the opposite happens when you walk into a live theater performance. If you walk in and you see the house 25% full, you are immediately depressed. 
And it's not just because you're wondering, what does everybody else know that I didn't? <laughs> it's also because whether you knew it or not, you were coming here to be part of an audience. You were coming here to be part of a group. The feelings that you have watching the live theater are amplified and magnified by the fact you're having it with your fellow citizens. And those of us who love the theater know this deeply and intuitively. You laugh harder when a thousand people are laughing with you. Your crying means more when it's shared by the people around you. And your attention, that moment when everybody in the theater is dead quiet, and it's weird because you wouldn't think that coughing was under people's control, right? Coughing is supposed to be a medical Somehow you hit that climactic moment in play and nobody ever coughs. It's dead silent. We have control of your autonomic nervous system, I guess. But that moment when all together you're waiting to see what happens next, it's the moments that heighten our experience and remind us that we're all in this together, that we're not alone. And that reminder of the fact that we are part of a community is also essential for democracy. Exactly the way we've watched democracy undermined by sitting at home on our computers and getting into our siloed pieces of information and just hearing the echo chamber of our own thoughts until we go out and do things that we couldn't have imagined doing if we'd actually been part of a collective. The Elizabethans also knew this about the theater. You look at why is Shakespeare our greatest player? There's a lot of reasons we can talk about it. But let me just point to one in particular. In Shakespeare, there is no such thing as a private relationship. When two people fall in love with each other, it's never just their business. It's also their family's business. It's their prince's business. It's their community's business. And in that, Shakespeare is dramatically more realistic than the stories we tell ourselves now. Because all of you who are in human relationships, of which I assume is most of you, all of you who have intimate friends, lovers, people you care about, you know that that's, that, that is influenced by everything, by, by your parents. It's influenced by your job. It's influenced by what your economic situation is. It's interesting, but what, it's much more than what happens between two people. Yet if you watch most contemporary American fiction, we, we, drama or television, we, we somehow are expected to believe that what's happening between these two individual people is in some kind of isolated monad. Shakespeare knew it never was. There were always at least 18 speaking parts. That's the size of his company. And he had to write parts for those people, trust me. But in doing so, he reflected a society that understood that it was a society, that understood that individual experience or even the experience of a couple, were not enough to understand what was actually going on. My theater was founded by Joe Papp uh, in 1954. Joe Papp was uh, actually born Jaroslaw Paparowski. Uh, he changed his name and pretended to be Polish. Um, and actually, he pretended so well that his first two wives did not know his parents were still alive and in Brooklyn. He was raised in a Yiddish-speaking household. He went into the Navy. In the Navy, he started getting interested in the theater. And aboard an aircraft carrier, he directed a musical review that Bob Fosse starred in. And it's one of the performances I wish I could go back in time and see. But in the early 1950s, he started what was, uh, in 1954, the New York Shakespeare Workshop and became the New York Shakespeare Festival. And its idea was simple, that in this great burst of optimism after the Second World War, Joe believed, as other people did, that the culture belonged to everybody and that Shakespeare should belong to everybody. He credited Shakespeare with his love of literature. He had a teacher in high school, Eulalie Robinson, who first started teaching him Shakespeare. He fell in love with Shakespeare. Of course, he never went to college. He credited himself by learning English by reading Shakespeare. So what he started doing was just taking Shakespeare for free out to the people of New York and performing on the back of flatbed trucks in boroughs and offering up also casts that looked like New York City. He was doing multicultural casting, colorblind casting, whatever terms we've used for it since, before anybody had a name for it. 
It was really simple. Why? That stage should look like the New York he grew up in. That stage shouldn't look like anyone was pretending to be English. And when one of our great examples of this is when Raoul Julia came along in the early 1970s, and he totally was encouraged and supported by Joe in doing Shakespeare in his beautiful Puerto Rican accent. It was a huge movement for the American theater to be able to say, Shakespeare can sound like us. We don't have to pretend that we're somebody else. He's not anybody else's property. He's America's property. He's our property. And when you take Shakespeare out to the people and let the people see him and let people understand, they can understand Shakespeare. You may think it's difficult. It isn't. In a good, but you just got to relax your ears for the first few minutes. And pretty soon, everyone gets what's going on. We go to prisons and we watch what happens when prisoners have never seen a play before start out like this, watching our mobile Shakespeare unit, and then gradually start to realize that they're understanding, and then start to realize they're caring. And we see them simultaneously get invested in the story and filling with pride at the fact that they understand Shakespeare, that Shakespeare belongs to them too. So that was what Joe did in 1954, toured Shakespeare um, around the boroughs, and had a monumental fight with the most powerful man in New York City history, Bob Moses, whose title of Commissioner of Parks doesn't begin to tell you how powerful he was. He beat Bob Moses. Moses wanted him to charge for Shakespeare in the Park. He thought Shakespeare in the Park could not be free. He wanted Joe to charge something for it, even 50 cents, and split it with the Park Department. Joe fought him, fought him in a public battle, and ended up fighting him in the courts. Moses actually red-baited Joe. Joe had been a member of the Communist Party, and Moses said that. Joe was hauled before the House on american Activities Committee, took the fifth, and was fired from his job as a CBS stage manager. At this point, Joe was just doing the public theater as a sideline. He wasn't even being paid for it. So this unemployed television stage manager was taking the most powerful man in New York history to court, and he won. And the the the... the Appellate court ruled that Moses had behaved arbitrarily and cruelly by denying the people the right to free Shakespeare in the park. And that was in 1958, and we've been doing it ever since. But he also realized, Joe, that in 1967, that it wasn't enough to take the great, take the canon, take the great art, and give it up to the people. What we also had to do was let the people write the canon put the voices of the people on stage. And he took over what is still our home, the old Astor Place Library in New York, and opened it. The first thing Joe ever produced, other than Shakespeare, was the world premiere of Hair. He was determined to put the life of the streets on stage. Actually, Clive Barnes, who was at that time the New York Times theater critic, panned it, hated it. And his most damning line was, Mr. Papp seems to have taken a broom and swept all of the trash off of the East Village streets onto his stage. <laughs> Joe blew that line up and put it in the lobby. <laughs> he was so proud of it. And that was an extraordinary thing. And Joe, you, we can sit back a little bit and see Joe as part of a much larger movement. He was doing fighting Moses in New York at the same time that Jane Jacobs was. There was a fight going on for trying to make our cities more democratic, for trying to, uh, an urbanism that believed that the life of the people was the life of the city. And one of the ways that that manifested in our beautiful little profession was what was called the nonprofit theater movement or the regional theater movement that was really started by women, Nana Vance and uh, Margot Jones in Texas, Zelda Fitch Handel in Washington, D.C. But Joe came just a few years after that. And that movement spread until today, every state of the union has professional nonprofit theaters. This is a category of theater that didn't exist before the Second World War. I've spent my entire career in an aspect of this field that wasn't there before I was born. And that is something that it's, it's had its failures, it's had its successes, but fundamentally it's now established as part of what we do in America. We have regional nonprofit theaters. We have professional theaters that are not there to make money. 
but are there to actually serve the community. So, great. Big success story. What's left to do? Everything. Because one of the things that I think has become clear is that success of the nonprofit theater movement has also contained some poison within it. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about programs that we are doing to try to speak to that. And then I'm going to stop and let you guys ask me questions. And first, I want to say, the fundamental thing that the public theater does and did and that we're doing right now is produce theater. We try to produce theater that speaks to the important issues of our times and produce theater that gives voice to people who otherwise don't have voice. Hamilton is an expression of that and a beautiful expression of that. That I'm sure a number of you have seen it and that moment in the very first number when the entire course, 95% black and brown people, walk down to the edge of the stage and sing about the United States, the thrill that was there opening night when we were there, Earl, but it was there from first preview on and it's still there, of saying these people are claiming the founding myth of America for themselves, saying this belongs to us. And Lin-Manuel had the genius idea of writing the story of the founding of the United States through the eyes of the only founding father who was a bastard immigrant orphan from the West Indies. And that sense of America being built by and belonging to its voluntary and involuntary immigrants was, is, is a statement that's larger than any of the specifics of that show. And I've watched that show light audiences on fire across the country and in England. And why are people responding that way? Because we have a desire to be proud of our country. We have a desire to be reminded of what is great, what is really great about America and the American dream, what is latent within the idea of democracy. And that show just embraces it head on. And I, I, sorry, now I start wanting to tell you the plots of all the shows we've ever done and why they're important. And I, I, I shouldn't do that. But I will tell you about a moment that happened to me um, after the 2016 election. Uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was a tough day that, for some of us. I'm not going to assume anything. But that, that first week of November in, in 2016. And we actually um, got to sort of end up in the crossfires of it over the course of the next year in a number of ways, including I did a production of Julius Caesar in Central Park that was probably a little intemperate and caused a big, I, I, they, so, so Julius Caesar looked a lot like our president and was assassinated by a coalition of black and brown senators. And the, the, you know, the Fox News got a hold of him, Sean Hannity got a hold of him, it made this huge stink. And uh, my daughter got a call on her phone and she called me and said, Dad, the Secret Service just called, they wanna talk to you. <laughs> I said, how did they get your number? And, and, and I said, and Kyle, how do you know they were the Secret Service? Well, they said they were. I said, okay. So I called the number back. The nice man answered. I said, I'm going to hang up the phone right now and dial the headquarters of Secret Service and let them connect me to you. And I did. And indeed, he was a Secret Service agent. And he said, uh, I am uh, going to be seeing you in your office at one o'clock this afternoon, which was three hours later. He didn't ask for an appointment. <laughs> so I'm in my office at one o'clock and two Secret Service agents come in that look straight out of men in black. You know, it's, <laughs> and it's actually a little intimidating at this point for me. It's all, this was all kind of rough. And they turn on a tape recorder one of them is taking notes, the other one starts asking me a question, and there is 30 minutes of dead, sober, serious grilling about trying to uncover any violent intentions I might have towards the President of the United States. I answered the questions honestly, I relaxed as we went on, because I'm going, this is really, I'm really not a criminal. This is really okay. But still, serious. Hit the end of the interview, the, the interviewer said, uh, this interview is now concluded. He turned off the tape recorder and he shut his book and said, and I want to tell you, Mr. Eustace, this investigation is now concluded and I love Shakespeare in the park. <laughs> 
So never assume demographic profiles. But the other thing that happened at that time is uh, Vice President-elect Pence came to see Hamilton on Broadway. And some of you may remember this because it became a little bit of a cause celeb. It was in January before the uh, actual inauguration. And uh, we only found out about two o'clock that afternoon that he was coming, and so it was a little frantic. And we composed a statement that uh, Brandon Victor Dixon, who was playing Burr, uh, read to the audience at the end of it. And it was an extremely polite statement, basically expressing the fact that many of the people up on stage are scared and are worried about the America that we're becoming and that we hope sincerely that you will take the concerns and fears of people like us into consideration in the White House. Um, Pence himself was terrific. He was booed roundly when he walked into the theater. Um, and he turned to his son and said, that's the sound of democracy, son. Good line, well done. And he didn't stay in the theater to listen to our letter to him, but he stood in the lobby and listened to the whole thing. So class act, handled it great. His boss, not so much. Um, and we received a, a number of very angry Twitters. Uh, this, this, was, this was the first of the demands that I apologized to him. I still haven't gotten around to it. Um, <laughs> but because of this, there was a um, internet petition to boycott Hamilton. And it was a petition that got about 200,000 signatures within the first three days. It's a lot of people signing on to this. And I looked at this and I said, there's actually something really wrong with this picture. None of these people were ever gonna see Hamilton. <laughs> it was not gonna come to a city near them. If it did, they probably couldn't afford the ticket. And if they could afford the ticket, they probably don't have the ins to get one. They aren't boycotting us. We've been boycotting them for a long time. And then, and I, I, I dare you to do this at home, pull up a map of the United States that's divided by county into the red and blue counties from the 2016 election. Look at that map and then hear my voice saying to you, oh, that's not an electoral map. That's a map of the nonprofit arts institutions, and the blue is where there are nonprofit arts institutions, and the red is where there aren't any. And it's going to be surprisingly accurate. Over the last 40 years, and I mean, it was true, it's from the first week of November 1980, but I'm not going to get that specific. Over the last 40 years, we in the cultural sector have essentially turned our back on half the country. We have said, you don't support us. You don't have the money for us. We're not getting money from the government anymore since the NEA has been emasculated. I mean, emasculated is the wrong word, sorry. Has been cut so firmly financially. So we're not going to pay attention to you. We're going to go where we're loved, to the big blue cities where there are lots of people who appreciate us. And we are going to do to you exactly what the economy has done, what education has done, what uh, uh, technology has done, which is we're basically going to leave you to your own devices. And you know what? It's not a good way to treat citizens of a democracy. And it's at that point that I started saying, our problem, the problem of who we're not reaching is extreme. So I'm going to show you now a couple of videos. I'm going to talk for a little bit between them two about programs that we've tried to initiate in which we're trying to actually shake up the paradigm that really started with the nonprofit theater movement in the 1950s. And the first of these is a program that I initiated with the brilliant visionary director, Lear de Bessonet, who you're, you're talking in a moment, called Public Works. And the basic idea was to say, what if we deliberately blur the line between who's a professional and who's not a professional? What if we actually say that artistry is not something that's binary, you're either an audience, you're an artist or an audience member, but is actually the possession of every human being, that every human soul has a need to communicate artistically, has a desire to communicate artistically, and has the ability to communicate artistically that 
we who are lucky enough to spend 10,000 hours practicing and then get to do it 60 hours a week, we've got advantages over people who only get to do it once a week for an hour in a class. But it's a scale, it's not an absolute difference. So with Public Works, we began working with community partners around the borough of New York. And one of the things we figured out as theater makers is we actually don't know that much about community organizing. Let's pair up with partners who do know about community organizing, connect with them, go to them, not say, we have a program for you, but go to these organizations and say, this is who we are, this is what we do, what would you like from us? My favorite is the Senior Center in Brownsville, which is the poorest neighborhood in New York, in, in, in deepest Brooklyn. What the women there wanted was a jazzercise class from the public theater. We nodded, we talked about it a little more, and then we gave a jazzercise class. And after about six months, we also were taking people to the theater. They started getting interested and said, well, maybe could we do a little of that kind of choreography that we're seeing there? We started to do some choreography. And this was eight years ago. Last year, the women of the Senior Center of Brownsville put on an all-female version of August Wilson's Fences that was one of the most beautiful evenings I've ever spent in the theater. So, you know, jazzercise was just an entry drug. But, 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 but the important thing about it was, and this is all Lear, this isn't me, Lear understood that the whole point is, this is anti-colonial. We can't go in there saying, we have something that you don't, and we're gonna give it to you. We have to go and say, what can we, how can we serve? And once the relationship is established on that basis, we, every year, we create these pageants in Central Park at the end of the summer. And now, this summer, it's gonna be for five weeks. You, you know, it started out just a weekend. And those pageants have some of the greatest actors in New York, Tony Award winners, nominees, but only five of them. And then we have 200 members of the community, some of whom have never set foot on a stage before, some of whom never saw a play till we started taking the shows at the public, and performing together. The first one was in 2013, 2012, 2012. And, you know, there were gonna be three performances of The Tempest, and I scheduled to see the first one, and then I was gonna give the toast at the end of the last one to say goodbye, and I saw the first one, and I have not missed a single public works performance in the years since, because what I knew was this was work that would be good for the people doing it. It would be helpful. What I didn't realize is it was the best art I was going to see that year. And that kept being true even two years later when we produced Hamilton. There is a euphoria that happens in public works. And what this started in our imagination was the idea that we could actually reposition the role that theater has in society, rather than viewing it as a guild, as literally a professionalized thing that you only touched if you had a union card that was separate from you. What if we actually said that the theater can be used by everybody in different ways, and that the particular virtues of the theater, the education in empathy, the education in problem solving, the education in self-confidence, in presentation of self, in cooperation, in collegiality, that that can be worked on a variety of different levels, and therefore, theater could play actually a bigger role in our social structure than could ever be filled by the idea of a non-profit professional theater. And if, um, Rico, if you, you wouldn't mind rolling the, this first clip, this is, this is about five minutes that will just give you a sense of what Public Works is like. Public Works is the public theater's attempt to make the boundary between artist and audience permeable. The idea is to create ambitious works of participatory theater in collaboration with community partner organizations from all over the city. Meaning that Public Works invites New York to come on stage and perform at the Delacorte Theater. To me, the perfect public works participant is someone who never imagined themselves on the stage at all. The core idea is to embody the fact that everybody is an artist. 
It's part of what makes you a human being. And we need to change the theater from being a commodity back into a set of relationships among people, which is what it really is. Hi, I'm Genesis, and I'm from the Bronx. Hi, my name is Shannon, and I live in Harlem. And I live in Queens, New York. My name is Gia, and my home is Brooklyn, New York, and here with you guys. It was an opportunity for me to do something that I didn't do as a younger person. I had no idea that I'd be doing this at this age. Every summer, we host auditions and then rehearsals for a show in the park. But the summer show is a slice of a very big cake of our programming. It's really, if anything, the cherry on top. Public Works offers free theater classes at each of our partner sites that are facilitated by master teaching artists. These classes are crafted around the goals and the interests of each of our communities. The groups come from such different places. Brooklyn, the Bronx, Long Island. You have the military involved. You have kids' choruses involved. We engage with our community 365 days of the year. So that by the time we're all gathered at the first potluck for the first rehearsal of the summer show, it's like a family reunion. We got very excited about the idea of having the program be much more than any one show because that word partnership is so, it is the truest description of what it is that we're looking for. We're looking for an organization that sees within its own vision for itself a way that theater arts could complement what they're already doing. So um, it's sort of like, where can our set of tools and interests meet yours? It's an ongoing thing that we have with the public theater. Getting people involved, if they have never read Shakespeare, exposing them to Shakespeare, how great is that? And on foot will take my brother in Arden and put him to the sword. There are people who have been doing the adult Shakespeare class for four or five years, and guess what? They're deeply trained Shakespearean actors now. So I think what I've seen is the depth that you get when you work with a community over time. I grew up being part of Public Works. I started when I was 14. I see myself now as a different person than I was before. I'm more confident in myself and I'm more open and it's allowing me to say yes and taking different opportunities. Oh my poor Rosalind, whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou change fathers, I will give thee mine. I charge thee be not thy more grieved than I am. I have more cause. Thou hast not, cousin. The Public Works has done a series of Shakespeare plays and one adaptation of Homer. And those plays all have themes of finding out who you are by traveling, by understanding yourself as part of a larger community. We're often interested in either like a hero's journey or this idea of a hard-won joy. And through struggle and through overcoming obstacles and difficulty, joy can be found. I was arrested on some uncurricular activities. Had I known about this earlier, I don't know where I'd be right now. It gave me a whole different outlook on life, period, you know. We really have built what feels like an amazing family. I'm not originally from New York and don't have family here. Through Public Works, I have gained nieces, nephews, cousins, brothers, sisters, and even grandparents. And in the rehearsal room, that, that's when those relationships really start being built. So. That gives you a little bit of an idea, but um, if you come to New York, uh, tickets to the Delacorte are free. Um, it's free Shakespeare in the Park, right? Which is important, because uh, it's not a commodity, it's a relationship. And in our, our second slot this coming summer is, you saw a little bit of As You Like It, and we're gonna be running it for five weeks this summer and for 2,000 people a night. And the, the experience that, I, weirdly, I can promise you, which I can't do with most theater, is euphoric and joyous. Because I've watched, again, I, I spoke about this a little bit with Hamilton, but it's even more with this. 
you see an audience see in front of them the vision of the city of their dreams, the city they want to live in, the city where everybody is part, everybody does share ownership. And that, you know, again, just the, the impact on the audience is extraordinary. And I'm delighted to say that this idea has proven infectious. We have actually more applications for partnerships than we know what to do with, but we currently have full partners in Dallas and in Seattle, and we, we've had a brilliant, brief, but sure to be returned uh, stint in Detroit with uh, the amazing Mosaic Theater. Um, and now the National Theater of Great Britain is part of our network. They've got their own public works going on. Um, we've added 14 more associate theaters this last uh, summer, and we did a convening this winter of all of those theaters. It's, it's, it's becoming a movement. And I am so thrilled by that, and I could bore you now a lot with the history of the American pageant movement that really was cut short by the First World War. But there was a time from about the 1870s until the First World War when there were pageants in communities all across the country. When they did a national convening of the pageant movement, they used Madison Square Garden as a place to convene. So this is something that has its roots in an alternative theatrical history of America. And if we can actually blend these things, this kind of theater plays an entirely different role in the lives of the community than any, any other kind that we can do. So that's one thing. Now, what, back to that electoral map, though, too. That, that was the other I was just faced with going, well, we're in New York, and we are doing everything we can to reach out to the communities within New York who don't have access to the arts. What the heck are we going to do about these red counties across the country who don't have nonprofit theaters, who don't have people? So we tried an experiment. And what we did was we took, uh, we, we produced the uh, uh, original production of Lynn Nottage's play Sweat, which some of you may know of. It is a brilliant, deeply researched play about what happened to Redding, Pennsylvania when the steel mills went to Mexico and the deindustrialization of Redding between 2000 and 2008 was the subject of the play. And again, Lynn spent months in Redding, Pennsylvania getting to know people. The entire play takes place in a bar. And just one of the things you see is that the first act, when everybody has a job, it's an interracial society where race is never mentioned. In the second act, when the jobs goes away, race suddenly becomes the defining characteristic of most. It's, it's, and it's so beautiful and stunningly observed. But it also has this special quality that a lot of plays don't have, which is our thesis was this could be watched by anybody, by the most rabid Trump supporter, and have them not feel patronized, looked down upon, or in any way maligned by the play. The play gave voice to those feelings and that, that led to that kind of support with exactly the same sympathy and moral right that it lent to other feelings. And we took that play and put it in a mobile version that would, you know, had eight pieces of furniture that we can put in the back of a truck and drive a van around, and we went, to, we went on tour. And um, I actually do need to do a shout out. Um, Earl, when he was at Mellon, allowed this tour to happen, so thank you, Earl. But we went to rural counties in Pennsylvania, here in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Ohio, and in Minnesota. And we found community partners there as we did with Public Works. Uh, my, my, my favorite partnership was in, uh, northern, in Haywood, Wisconsin, uh, of northern Wisconsin. Our partners there, there was a partnership between the Native American College on the reservation and the Rotary Club. And we performed at the college, and all of the people who were brought by the Rotary Club said they'd never been on the campus of the college before. So we found community partners to, again, do the part that we don't do, the community organizing. And we formed relationships, and we performed that play in gymnasiums, and church basements, and food pantries, and UFW halls across the Midwest. And the responses we got were better than I could have imagined. And for those audiences, we would have, you'll see in a moment, just an example, we would have intense discussions 
at the end of these shows. And the discussions was so much the point of the whole event. And in all of these sites, I was at most of them, nobody mentioned Trump, nobody mentioned Hillary Clinton, nobody talked about Democrats, nobody talked about Republicans. They talked about their life experience. They talked about what it felt like to have Main Street in their town boarded up. They talked about what it felt like to lose a job that not only you had had for your own life, but that your father before you had had for his own life. They talked about what happened to the opioid epidemic, what, the way the opioid epidemic took off when unemployment took off. And those discussions were so beautiful and so, I mean, I know I've been extolling the virtues of dialogue and conflict, but there's also virtues to dialogue that isn't about conflict. It's just about listening to each other. And um, I'm gonna show you a very brief clip that we made on that tour and then talk a little bit more and then you can ask questions if you want. So Rico, if you could run the second one, I would be grateful. We live in the shadows of a once prosperous area, one of the busiest ports on the Great Lakes where people could graduate from high school on one day and the next day get a job, and that's been stripped away. We've lost our jobs, our children have moved away, and our lifestyle as we know it has been radically altered. Tonight, tonight made me know how angry I was when I was out of work. And it's bad when you're mad and angry and don't know who to take it out on. You don't never know what you had till you get taken from you. If you look at some of the inside, the conditions of some of these places, the stuff that people have to endure and what they're, it's terrible. I seen the part where he played, you know, as like when the drug set in. You need to pull yourself together. This bullshit's got to stop. I'm trying. <clears throat> don't give me that look. I'm trying, okay? I'm trying. You high? Being on the other side and falling victim to drug addiction. I have a daughter in Rutgers University right now. I remember she used to tell me, like, Dad, I love you. Where's my dad? This hit me in such a deep spot that I can't even tell you because I lived through this. And I live with the hope of it getting better. A lot of these folks, they don't get to go downtown um, to the Erie Philharmonic or to the Erie Playhouse or, you know I mean, places like that. A lot of them, they don't, they have no idea. Most of the people that will be here tonight have never been to a play. It really <laughs> was a total surprise for me because I never thought about anybody else going through the changes that we went through when the shop went down. I mean, I've been angry for a lot of years. But now I feel better. To me, this is what theater is meant to be. It's meant to be this conversation. It's meant to be this close. And it's meant to really represent a broad spectrum of our population and things that are oftentimes unseen and unspoken. Those of us that are here tonight, we can go back and say, you know, I went through a segment of healing. And we have a lot of people that are still holding emotions. Even though there are times that are very difficult, there's always hope at the end. All we have to do is come together and help each other. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Yeah. So I, I hope that gives you some sense of what this experience was like. Thank you. And you know, again, as with so many of the programs we do like this, for the actors, it's just addictive. It's really hard to go back to standing up on a stage in the light and you guys in the dark and doing a play when you've had the intensity of that kind of relationship to an audience and that experience. So this was a pilot program that we did in the fall of 2018. And in every way, it was a beautiful success. Uh, except we now have to figure out how to keep paying for it. 
So I'm glad to say that after a lot of work, we've put together another sum of money that's going to allow us to do three things, really. One is send sweat back out, and we're going to do the same tour. We're going to drop off a few sites. Um, there was, honestly, I'll tell you, there was one site that was a little too close to Ann Arbor, so the audience loved the show, and most of them had seen public theater shows before. And there was, and, and literally, at one point, when I was explaining to the audience, you know, we're 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 trying to take this out to the people who've really experienced this. Somebody in the audience said, what did they say? <laughs> and I was like, no, it was supposed to be you. So anyway, we have, we, we have to change some of our sites, but we're gonna go back and deepen our relationship with the community organizations, and again, just try start laying down some rails. Second thing is we've got another play I think we can do this with, which is Jessica Blank uh, and Eric Jensen uh, are brilliant documentary uh, theater makers. They, they uh, did The Exonerated, a fantastic piece about the death penalty, um, as well as other pieces. But we sent them down to West Virginia uh, to interview the surviving folks from the uh, Big Ben mining disaster in 2011, where 29 miners were killed due to just radically unsafe mining practices. And they went down there, they interviewed folks, they stayed for the trial of the owner of the mine, Don Blankenship, and they've created this documentary play about coal country and about these people. And I'm just delighted to say that Steve Earle has not only written songs for it, he's now performing in it and he's gonna be with us. And we're gonna take that play on tour to coal country as we take Sweat back out to the Midwest. And the third thing we're gonna be trying to do is really network and start to form a coalition with our brother and sister theaters across the country who we, many of whom we have very close relationships with, with Joe Hodge at the Guthrie, uh, Laura at the Cleveland Playhouse. There are folks that we know really well and hopefully we can start, as we've done with Public Works, to create the kind of alliances that we can get more people, I mean the public obviously can't do all this by ourselves, but if we could get a buy-in and a commitment to reaching the communities that are not currently served by the theater. That's also a way that we change the role that theater plays in the life of this country. And if there's one thing that is crying out to us right now is that we've got to figure out what we can do to try to turn us back into one country. Uh, because the speed and rapidity and ferocity with which we are dividing into separate countries is not only um, unpleasant, ethically unpalatable, but it is literally dangerous. So I speak to you tonight, obviously, as somebody who believes the theater has a role to play. I don't think the theater has the biggest role to play or the most important role to play, but I think it has an important role to play, and it's the field that I work in. It's a field that I hope some of you are going to be working in, and I hope participating. And I do think we can try to make a difference. So that's what I'm going to say to you tonight. And I'm happy to receive any questions. Uh, <laughs> we, we have two microphones. Should there possibly be any more than one person demand, we can make little lines there. Oh, yeah, take a minute to leave, those of you who want to leave. We'll, we actually will literally, let's take a couple of minutes so that those who want to depart don't have to feel like they're ruining our parade. Okay, you've had your minute, now I'm gonna ask you to be quiet as you exit, and we're gonna take some questions. Yes? Hi, my name is, hello. Oh, my name is Natalie, and I'm a musical theater student, so it's, thank you so much for being here. I very much admire the public's work. Thank you. Um, my question for you is, what do you think is it about the theater that most connects people? Um, I, I think it's a shared experience. I think it's the, the what she, she's asking, what about theater most connects people? And the thing that I've observed is that people can watch a character on stage who is very different from who they are, have experiences and identify with those. And through that identification, it says, actually, like the guy in the video said, realize that you're a lot less alone than you think, that you have a lot more in common with other people than you think you do. Well, thank you. 
Sure. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hi there. Uh, my name is Evan Straczynski. I'm a theater design student. I was, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the process of uh, thinking about about like once realizing the issues that are going on with yeah. who theater is reaching, um, how you came to the conclusion of reaching ideas for what you could do, and going through all essentially the board drama and all of the necessities of getting an entire group of theater mm. professionals to agree to that and fund it, as opposed to just having the great idea of how to solve theater isolation. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, that's the $64,000 question every day of my life. And it's a little easier for me now because I'm in my 60s and I've got a track record and I know a lot of people, so I can get some people to listen to me more quickly than I could when I was in my 20s. But the basic task is still the same thing. You've got to find other people who see the problem that you see, who are invested in trying to solve it, and are convinced that the direction that you're pointing in has value. I, I will tell you, one of the reasons that my career is taking the shape it has is I can fundraise. And people often say to me, oh, I'm so sorry you have to do that fundraising. You know, the art is fun, but isn't the fundraising oral? No, no, the fundraising is just as fun as the art because you're doing the same thing. First day of rehearsal of a new play, what happens? You have a bunch of actors sitting around the table basically not trusting you, not trusting the other people, not trusting the play, worried that they are somehow going to be used and abused and treated badly and exploited the way they usually are. And your job as the director is to convince those actors that if they put their resources into that thing on the center of the table, the play, and their resources mean their heart, their talent, their, if they put their resources in there, they will be happier. It will pay off for them. That's, I've just described what fundraising is. You're sitting around a table with people whose resource happens to be money, and what you are saying is that if you invest, you don't give the money to me. If you invest in this idea, it is actually gonna make your life better. And every conversation is a form of testing that concept. And I've had some really great ideas that I haven't talked about here because I tested them and nobody went for them. <laughs> Cause, cause they, which means they weren't that great ideas or I didn't find the right way to express them. You have to gather people in commonality around what you're trying to do. And that starts with, like, I mean, I know we have maybe some students left in the room, um, but but, but the, it, it starts right at the beginning of your career. The thing that you want to do is find the other artists who you feel some commonality with, who you like their work, they like your work, you find you see the same thing, and then cling to them by their tentacles and don't let them go for the rest of your career. Those, but seriously, those people are what's going to make the rest of your career. The most honest bio I could give you would just be a list of names the people that I have worked with over the years. And the, 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 the great mistake that people in the theater make is to think that they have an individual career. They don't. They have a set of relationships. And if they cling to those relationships, cultivate those relationships, are loyal to those relationships, develop those relationships, you can look around and suddenly you have a career. But what you've really done is you've risen up with the other people you share with. This is probably not true of novelists. It is, however, I think, true of theater people. Hope that's helpful. It was. Thank you very much. You bet. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Thank you for coming. Pleasure. Um, I'm going to be speaking in drafts, so just bear with me because I'm finding the question and it's coming to me. But uh, I guess my question is around this idea of catharsis in the theater and yeah. like how catharsis relates to democracy uh -huh. um, in that there is so much tension in the world. And yes. um, so what, so I guess I, I hear the saying like, oh, like sometimes real life is kind of like theater. Like, or, and, and like I have experiences where I'm like, whoa, that was like a scene or like that was like, like something that could be on stage. Like someone could write that in. Um, have you had instances um, or experiences where life is, or where the theater is, 
like where that. life is like theater and theater is like life and like what's uh -huh. the difference between that and because there's this kind of suspension of disbelief and then the belief itself I am I making yeah you're making sense? complete sense okay. and <laughs> let, 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 let me I'm going to attack it from two different ways yeah. just because there's two different things I want to say and one of them is that the core thing that makes theater an art is that it doesn't just describe, it embodies how people change. And the, I mean, I think it's the thing that distinguishes it from other art forms. And it's the thing that has to happen for a piece of theater to actually happen. You have to watch a change happen. I, I, I give you an example. The first play that Tony Kushner ever wrote that I directed, Bright Room Called Day, we just revived it and, you know, it was... Anyway, it's a story. But it, 35 years ago, and uh, in 1987, I did the first production of it. And um, it was a modest success. And what was clear is that Tony was a brilliant writer. He had great ideas. He could make great characters. It was an incredibly interesting situation. But the standard Tony Kushner scene was two characters walked on having felt and thinking great things. They exchanged those thoughts and feelings, and the scene was over. Nobody changed. So we read the poetics. We talked a lot. I commissioned the next play, which turned out to be Angels in America, he, which the agreement I have is for a 90-minute one-set comedy. <laughs> and after about a year, he'd done this beautiful writing, and he came to me and he said, I can't get these people to change, Oscar. They're just not changing. And he then broached me the idea of doing a two-evening play. And I laughed patronizingly, which I, I could do back then. I could patronize Tony Kushner 30 years ago. And I explained to him that he was just being self-indulgent, that he just needed to cut more. And, you know, and, of course, I lost that argument. And what Tony then did was take that difficulty of making people change and make it the core subject of the play. And I think the reason I can say Angels America, and so many of you know who, who, what I'm talking about, is because the characters and angels change in a way that feels more believable than 95% of the fiction that we watch. We actually believe Lewis has changed, that Pryor has changed, that Harper has changed by the end of that play. That's what the theater does, and that's what we try to do in real life. And what I, for me, the, the hope of theater is that it holds up to us the possibility that change can happen, including that we can change. And that, I think, is important. Now, the other part about, and I want to talk about theater in real life, Walter Benjamin said that fascism aestheticizes politics while communism politicizes aesthetics. And to put that in slightly more understandable terms, what he meant that fascism tried to make a work of art out of politics or a work of theater out of politics. We have, currently in Washington, a lot of people who are treating politics as if it's a piece of theater. And that's actually demeaning what politics is and demeaning what the theater is. That the point is to take theater and try to expose within it what it says about the way we politically relate to each other. And the, the, I, I bet some of those times when you said, oh, this feels like a scene, was not a good thing that you were saying. It felt, but, but sometimes it feels like a scene because people are faking something, because people are not talking about the real subject. But that's not what the theater should really feel like. The theater should feel as real as real. Thank you, I didn't even begin to touch your whole question, but yes. Hello, my name's Isabel Olson. I'm a theater directing and history double major. Um, Good. Something that I often think about and I'm quite troubled by is the lack of resources available to bring writers from diverse backgrounds and divisors and directors and creators to experiment with work when there's no clear guarantee that it's going to happen. And I was wondering if you could speak to like writer residencies becoming a, having a place in yeah, future American theater. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 forgive me, I'm an old guy. So let me tell you what we tried to do about that because we totally recognize that problem. So 14 years ago, um, with, oh my gosh, support from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, we, we started something called the Emerging Writers Group. And we looked around and said, okay, the issue is who can't get to us? And our theory was that anybody who has an agent knows how to get to us. 
Anybody who's already had a production in New York knows how to get to us. Anybody who has an MFA from a fine university knows how to get to us. And so let's make a group where you can't have any of those things. You can't have an agent, you can't have a production. You, sometimes we let people with MFAs in, but we're very reluctant to do that. Um, what's the other problem? Well, you know, for a lot of people, the MFA, which is now the standard route to becoming a professional playwright, it wasn't when I started, is not only unaffordable financially, it's unthinkable culturally. They're not going to spend three years in a graduate program to become a playwright. So what we need to do actually is instead of charging people tuition, we actually need to pay them so they can afford to come to this. So the Emerging Writers Group, we pay several thousand dollars a year to these writers. We select, we get huge applications. We select 10 to 12 uh, uh, a year. Actually, it's a, it's a two year cycle we do now because we found one year wasn't enough. And they're, they're an astonishingly diverse group of people. And what the promise that we make is it's got nothing to do with production. We don't promise that we will ever produce your play. We don't promise you know, anything. Except what we promise is that two years from now, you will know everybody in this theater, you will know exactly how this theater works, and we will have introduced you to everybody in the New York theater, so you will have a place at the table. You are now, you get invited to the party. And now you can go as far as your talent will take you. And I'm happy to say that the program has been a huge success, both for some of the illustrious alumni like Brandon Jacob Jenkins and Dominique Morisot, Michigan's own Dominique Morisot, um, and uh, Mona Mansour. I mean, there's wonderful success stories. But for me, probably the more important measure is that almost without exception, everybody who comes out of the Emerging Writers Group instantly gets an angel, uh, an agent at our showcase. So they instantly are invited into. That's one way to do it. But, but what I would point out is that it was a conscious analysis of what's missing, who's not here, and what do we need to do to get them here? They, I, 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 I'm gonna, I'm trying to be brief, um, but, but I wanna use the example of the Mexican muralists, um, uh, uh, Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, Sigueros. Uh, I went to an exhibition once at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art of the muralists' work in the 1920s, and uh, I was flabbergasted, because they were still lifes of oranges and vases of flowers, and they look like any, you know, talented painter from a European conservatory would have been painted in the 1920s. And doing a little more research, that was the point. The muralists didn't wake up with an artistic inspiration of why don't we become the muralist movement? They said, we're not reaching the people that we say we want to reach. We are not working on the subjects that we say matter to us, so what should we do? Well, let's paint outdoors so people don't have to pay to see it. And they, not only do they have to pay to see it, they'll just stumble upon it. Let's paint really big so a lot of people can see it. And let's paint subjects that mean something. So in other words, the muralists thought their way into that movement. We can do the same thing. We can think our way into these problems. And then, of course, we can't solve all of them. But we can make starts. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name's Catherine, and Hi, Catherine. I'm a student here. Uh, and I think you're really good at like talking to people and getting their attention. I didn't nod off even once, which doesn't happen uh, in all of my lectures. It's uh, like the nicest thing anyone said to me. So my question was, I was curious, how do you get better at like really getting people's attention when you talk and um, illustrating your ideas clearly to people so they make sense and they want to engage with them? There is only one way, which is practice. And I don't mean technical practice. Um, the thing that thing I want to say again to any young student artist, your job is to pursue becoming yourself as purely as you can. I hire hundreds of people a year, right? I don't hire artists because they're flexible. They can do anything. Or because, look, they've got so many different skills. I hire them because there's something in their spirit, specific, that I recognize and I say, I want to be around that spirit. And the people who do that are the people who don't just practice convincing, but practice trying to become themselves. So that's when you have something to say. 
When you actually, and I, I don't mean this in some sort of mystical way, I mean refining what you believe. What, what do you like? What do you not like? What do you, how do you explain to somebody what you like and don't like? How do you listen to other people and let them poke holes in your argument? I, I, I mean, like I said, what you're hearing right now is the distillation of thousands of conversations I've had, many of which have proved that the idea I was pushing wasn't any good. So I don't talk about the ideas that weren't any good because other people have knocked them down. It's, you know, and then ultimately, I'm a big, white, cisgender, straight, male, extrovert who does this thing, right? It, the future is not mine. It really isn't, and it's not people like me. It's my job to help prepare the ground for another kind of leadership, and boy, it would be great if you were one of them. Hello, Hi. I like your shoes. Thank you. Um, so I'm an inner art student here um, at UMish, and one of my struggles when looking for a school was um, in the future I'd like to work um, in art directory and set design for film, theater, and dance. Um, but as you may know, I don't know, there's not really any programs like set pathways um, directly for art directory. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit um, on your path to becoming an art director um, just in general or with um, public works and like how you found yourself um, like working that community. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, the, 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 the horrible thing about setting out to be an artist and the great thing about setting out to be an artist is there is no ladder. There is no career path that you can just get on and move in the next step, move in the next step and end up. So you have to invent it yourself. And um, I, I didn't, Earl exaggerated my educational achievements, which really ended at high school. Um, and the high school that I went to burned down, so actually even the paper record of my <laughs> high school diploma doesn't exist. Um, but what I started doing was trying to find people who were doing work I admired and hang around them. And a huge, it, it's seriously, a, it, one of the things you find out when you start really being interested in people is if you're really passionate about somebody's work, they often like you to be around. It's actually, you know, you have to figure out some way to get money, you know, because you can't always get paid for that at first, and the money thing is always hard. But literally try to connect to the artists who you care about and whose careers you admire, and things start opening up. The other, this is, this feels like really cheap <laughs> advice, but the other thing that I found is that um, I, I was lucky, and when I was very young, I made a bunch of money in Switzerland that I could live off of for a while, for a couple of years, which was great. And then what I did is I could go into organizations and say, you don't have to pay me. I can work here, you know, it's like an internship, right? Um, and then my job was to make myself indispensable, was to make sure that six months after I got there, they couldn't imagine that place without me. And it just, you know, because that's like a really selfish way of being of service. <laughs> You know, you're being selfish, but what you're trying to do is serve other people. And you'll figure this out. This way. Follow your passions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Jacqueline. Um, I'm a writer. And I was wondering, so when I think about theater, I think a lot about um, getting the audience to trust you. Yep. And I was wondering if you've found ways or seen other people do things that really did help build that trust. I mean, honestly, I mean, the joke version of this is Laurence Olivier said that sincerity is the most important thing in acting. So once you've learned to fake that, you can do anything. <laughs> um, but the, the, the real version of it is that people will trust you if you're trustworthy. And that means every play is making a contract with the audience. And that contract can involve formal contracts. It can involve, you know, there's the, the French classicists had the notion of the obligatory scene, that every play in its first 15 minutes is setting up a scene that has to happen before the play is over and that the whole play is a trajectory towards that. That's true of some plays, it's not true of others. But what I think is helpful is if you recognize the contract you're making with the audience, what you're saying to them you're going to do, and then you actually do it. But the most important part of that isn't technical law, it's about telling the truth. It's about having something, something to say and trying to really say it and trying to say it as exactly as you can. 
um, a famous alum of this place, Arthur Miller, once said, I have never written anything of value that didn't embarrass me. And I find that to be so true, that when you first create something that you really care about, the first response is shame. Because, because it's something you care about so deeply, you're scared that other people will shame you for doing it. You've got to learn how to get past that because that's actually the thing that they want from us. It's what, it's what we want from artists. We want artists to be brave and to be willing to share things that we're too scared to share. And good luck. <laughs> Oh, hi. Hi, Oscar. Guess, I'm just, I'm letting you know that you have five minutes and then we have to clear this room in five minutes. So, <laughs> just so you know. Thank you. But, but this, she was done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very briefly, uh, my question is kind of in light of the road to hell being paved with good intentions. A lot of these programs that you've set up are meant to reach, you know, audience members that theater is not meant for. Yeah. But what, what can be done when something rises to popularity, as Hamilton has, that it is now inaccessible to those same people that it was made for? Oh, God, that's, <laughs> that's, so, that's like putting salt in the wound and then <laughs> putting your finger. So, but I'll tell you exactly what we've done. First thing is, in every major city where there's a sit-down company of Hamilton, 25,000 Title I school kids a year go to see it for 10 bucks. And they don't just get to see the show. We have a whole educational curriculum so that uh, the, we call it Eduham, uh, which I think is a particularly embarrassing nickname. But, but it, you know, it happens like every couple of weeks in New York and it's the most beautiful thing on earth because what happens is the kids come to the theater and the morning they perform for the cast the pieces that they've created based on American history. And then the cast talks to them and then they get to watch the show. That's 25,000 kids a year in New York, in San Francisco, in Chicago. I think that means something. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you. It, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not good enough, though, right? I know it's not good enough. And that's the, the, the we have to overthrow capitalism. But <laughs> we'll talk about that separately. Um, <laughs> Earl, it was so nice. You notice when he was talking about my parents, he said the Democratic Farmer Labor Party and the CP. So, yeah, my folks were communists. <laughs> um, but um, uh, the, the other thing that I'm trying to do, and I have not won this argument yet, but I think I will. I, I think I'll win it within a year with my commercial partners, is I want to release the rights to Hamilton to every high school in the country. So that, because, you know, and of course that's not traditionally how you do it. You wait till you've squeezed every drop of profit out of every possible other thing, and then you let high schools do it. But my thesis is that this would be a, gold mine for us, that for the next decade, the only way you get to see Hamilton is you see one of our companies or you watch your kid do it. And I think, a, I, I went to an inner city school, high school in Minneapolis, Central High School, um, that was uh, uh, overwhelmingly black high school. And um, uh, there were a bunch of us who hid in the theater department for most of, the, uh, most of our high school career. And I know what it would have done to that theater department if they were able to do Hamilton suddenly that theater department has an entirely different role in the school. So th that don't write letters because then <laughs> Jeff will know I'm talking to you all about it. Um, but I think we can make it happen. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Mr. Jesus. Hi. I'm Sam. I'm a Hi. theater arts major and I study playwriting too. I was wondering if you could speak to the responsibility, the political responsibility of an artist and how it's shifted from the time that you began your theater career to now. Whoosh. Uh, I, I can say something about that. I don't know if, how profound it'll be um, because I deeply believe that every artist has to make up their own mind about what they care about. Um, what, I, what I hope through my teaching, my example, I hope to continually remind people that caring about politics is part of caring about being a human being that the wider you shed your lens on society, actually the deeper your art can get. But how that manifests for every artist is completely different. So the way that manifests for Tony Kushner is totally different from how it does from Susan Laurie Parks. The way it manifests for Jeremy O'Harris is totally different from the way it manifests for David Henry Wong. And I don't want to say totally different, there's some overlaps. But, but, but that's the thing about the, 
if I were to tell you the one difference between the theater and film that Matt, that it, it is most, is that in the theater, the writer has the copyright. They own it, it's theirs. In the theater, and not true in film, in the theater, what we want is individual voices. What we, we don't want committees. We don't want focus groups telling. We want an individual human voice looking at the world and saying, this is what I see. And for that, you don't want to put political prescriptions on anybody. Last thought about that. I'm, then I'll stop, I promise. Or I'll take a last question. We only have like one minute because there's another group coming into the theater. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. so just the last thing I'll say is that Stephen Spender, uh, the poet, once asked Andre Melrose back when Melrose was a good guy, um, what, what do you do to write political art? Because he thought he should. And Melrose said, you just write about your life. You have to live a political life. And I think that's the most important thing that you have control over. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just so want to hear your question, I but I can't. Why don't you let both of them ask, okay. and then you have to answer both questions together in like Thanks. a 30 second wrap. <laughs> Why did you pick to go into the work of theater, and how did that change your life? That's an easy one. I was gonna ask, like, how your how your opinions, like, when you went to high school calls, like, formulate over time, and how does that influence, like, what you decide to do, and how you decide to do your theater? I went into the theater because I grew up in Minnesota and I was too loud and laughed too loudly and everybody thought I was a weirdo and I definitely cried too easily. Uh, for a boy in Minnesota, that was really bad. And I thought I was nuts until I wandered into the theater and said, I went, oh, all of these problems of mine are actually strengths. <laughs> and seriously, it was emotional. I felt at home in the theater. And my views change over time because I try to learn constantly and I try to learn from people constantly. So the, the, again, the list of names, who you associate with. And if you, you guys know this in all fields, if you, there's one divide between a terrific leader and a bad leader, it's the terrific leaders surround themselves with the smartest, strongest people they can who would threaten the heck out of them, who could replace them, and you work with those people. And if you're not that, you surround yourself with people who make you feel comfortable and don't scare you. And uh, that's a really bad policy, not only for leadership, it's a bad policy for life. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful to talk to.